Is everybody good with the, the minutes? Yes, yes, I would just like to ask that in the future we spell out two rivers, Bataquichi, Regional Commission, or whatever, because in the future people might not know what TROC is. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sounds like uh, and then I'm, will we talk about whether there is a site visit tomorrow or not later in the meeting? There isn't one. Yeah, I put in the email that there is not. Okay. And so I say in a minute saying the site visit is off, but there were so many people, you know, it was I'm ambiguous. Is that wrong? Yeah. So we don't need to go at all. Great. That's good. Okay, um, we'll move right on to the workers' comp thing. So, and so let me just introduce, yeah. um, I want to yes. just Wade in, in the subject matter for you. So um, Wade Mazur from uh, BLCT Passive um, is uh, with us tonight. Um, it's the insurance arm of BLCT, it covers our property liability and uh, also our workers' comp. Uh, compensation insurance and um, Wade and I and uh, Martin have been talking the last couple of months um, since we've had uh, two instances of workers comp uh, situations arise um, and in both situations actually particularly the one earlier in the summer I uh, kind of popped up particularly on a Monday morning um, it was kind of an unidentifiable injury and uh, ended up going to the emergency room and um, kind of followed course from there. <coughs> As part of kind of a regular follow-up, um, BLC did kind of come and talk to us um, about our policies and procedures and uh, some ways that we can tighten up uh, the way we do things now. And um, we are fairly informal at this point in time uh, when it comes to workers' comp. Of course, we haven't had a real historic problem with uh, workers' injuries. Um, the two that we've had have been kind of, um, we've got two or three the last year maybe, um, in particular two this summer. So it's kind of an anomaly for us, but kind of brings to light the way we do things and again, policies and procedures. We do do a first report of injury, uh, and that is basically state law that we need to um, identify if somebody's injured, we need to report it, report it to the state and to VLCT. Um, but in the, this particular instance, in one of them, um, it was verbalized uh, that um, he was sore, um, may have injured something, may not have, um, Bill was out, um, Doug was <coughs> filling in. <coughs> Uh, and things kind of fell through the cracks as far as doing a first report of injury or at least following up on the injury. And, um, you know, that was one item. And again, um, you know, Doug is not an historical foreman, but uh, just having that in place and knowing, making sure that everybody knows that if there's an injury, they need to report it to their supervisor or to Martin, um, who is essentially our, our HR department. Uh, so in your packet, um, you had a written response essentially from Wade and VLCT on um, some recommendations to uh, us, and in your packet is also some language on policies and ways to strengthen it. One of the things I'm not running and jumping on board with at the moment is to have a safety committee, uh, simply because we're so small, um, so it would essentially almost make up a most of the staff. Um, so I think that um, taking care of some of the other three to four um, action steps I think is very worthwhile for us to take on. Um, and that's strengthening the uh, first report of injury, um, having a designated provider for the um, employee to go to, <coughs> essentially having a follow-up uh, with the employee as to how um, things could have been um, a little better or why did the injury uh, occur and then a return to work policy which I think is also very important because um, in both instances um, the employee may be able to come back to work um, if we have light duty um, I think it's to our benefit to put that person back to work um, the injury is covered under workers compensation uh, however when they come and do their yearly audit and they start to tally up the days or weeks that they have paid for, 
uh, we end up paying for that over the next three or four years at a much higher premium. So it does come back to haunt us. Pay the LCT or pay the state? What's that? Who is who is asking for reimbursement at that point? The state or VLC? So VLCT is our insurance, and Wade can right. get into this a little bit. So we're essentially self-insured. Yes. So the town, towns pay into a pool um, that is managed by VLCT passive. And uh, when a worker goes uh, to workers comp, um, that is paid for out of the workers comp pool. Uh, however, uh, the way they keep that Planished, or the person or, or the town that has so the higher or the more injuries that you have, mm -hmm. the higher your premiums are. And we've had some pretty good premiums in the past. Um, but if you put these policies in place uh, and you keep your workers' comp down, then your policy or your premiums tend to stay lower. Okay. <coughs> Uh, just as an example, and this is kind of an extreme example, but when I was in St. Jay, we had a firefighter that was hurt his back, was out for like five months. Uh, our workers' comp for the fire department jumped like $38,000. So it is, hmm. you know, there is a, Skipping cake. It, it, um, there's a parallel track there. So um, that's kind of where we're at. Um, I think Martin and I firmly believe that these are policies that um, would be good to implement. Uh, again, I keep talking about structure and um, you know some professionality, and I think that uh, having these policies in place provides that more than kind of just having a oh okay you injured yourself. You know, go to whoever you go to, and then a month later we get some sort of a letter stating what maybe they can and can't do, and we're kind of the last to know. So that's something that we would kind of like to avoid. So I hope I didn't well, take up everything here. <laughs> but, uh, well, I'm here to answer any questions uh, <laughs> to help shed light on any of this. Uh, this is nothing new. It's something we recommend with all our members, large and small. And something probably, in all fairness, something probably that we've really been kind of pecking away at in the last three or four years more or so uh, in the past. We just really want to get opportunities to work with our members to kind of, as you said, tighten up their workers' comp. What we call workers' comp, best practices, uh, because it's the one they have, you know, big, obviously a large cost, but it's also one of the biggest things that you as the employer have control over um, for the for the best outcome for not only the town but the affected employee as well. So um, there, you know there's there's more and more towns, member municipalities that are either looking at this or already have implemented it over the last few years. Um, not everybody has, but a lot of them that we've you know slowly worked with have gone ahead and done it because they realize that it's probably the best thing to do for everybody. Um, so there are kind of, yeah, four, there's kind of four things to the workers' comp best practices. There's the proper, basically proper reporting procedures, having a safety slash wellness committee, um, the designated medical provider piece, and the modified duty or return to work program. So in the event, the, the two single best things that you can do to control them cost over time would be at least the designated provider and return to work program. That's what you have control over. Uh, and basically the things that you can do as outlines and them policies that um, are really the best outcome for the, for the employee as well as the town. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about how the designated provider works? <clears throat> sure. So basically, the de as a designated medical provider, the town would be choosing ideally some type of occupational health uh, person, uh, provider. Uh, typically, we like to have them within not more than a 30-minute drive time. These are for non-emergency type incidents. They're not for, you know, if somebody cuts their leg with a chainsaw and they're bleeding to death, that's, this isn't for that kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's you do what you call 911 and you do what you gotta do. So what is it? What, what the, these are for more of the, you know, the, the, the strains and the 
pulled muscles and uh, you know I slipped out getting out of the truck on a snowy night uh, I fall down the stairs and hurt my knee and I'm limping for the next three days um, then these basically anything that's not just typically like not emergent I mean it's you know you get up the next day and something something isn't quite right quite right for what as a result of what happened yesterday or whatever um, so yeah, so that's um, so there. So as a designated medical provider, you as the employer have the authority or <coughs> state of the mind. You have you can elect to establish this program, and the first stop for your injured employee would be your provider, the town's provider. And by doing that, it just opens up a whole series of things that you know as needed. Hopefully, it doesn't open up anything more than what needs to be opened up. But as far as services and programs, and it just kind of streamlines who's, you know, you have one provider that's talking to the town, that's talking to the affected employee, and typically that just makes a much better outcome. They can track. They, they, not only that, but the designated medical provider typically, in most cases, have a better understanding of all the workers' comp. Uh, rules and regulations and the do's and the don'ts for workers' comp, because that's what they deal with is, uh, much more effectively. They also, in turn, can deal with our, or work with um, our adjuster, the workers' comp, whoever's handling the claim for us, um, much more effectively. So it's, and, the, and their whole emphasis is to get, you know, the whole emphasis really is to make that injured employee better as soon as possible. And not only that, but get them that back to work in some capacity, even if it's you know twenty percent for the next month, because any time you can do that, you're saving you know taxpayer dollars on your down the road workers' comp costs. The other thing I did look up is, and I won't get into this too much, but basically we have what we call you probably some of you probably heard of workers' comp experience mods. It's basically a factor that the actuaries and all of them look at, and I don't pretend to, pretend to know everything about it, but basically, where, you, where an employer such as the town of Heartland wants to be is at a one. If you're at a one, you're average. And again, this is just for workers' comp claims and workers' comp injuries and all this. So if you're at a one, you're kind of like, that's where we should be. We're not great, we're not bad, we're just we're doing what we should be doing. Anytime you're greater than that, that means that you're having great, more workers' comp losses than really what the, what the uh, actuaries and the formulas say that you should for your size and your risk and all that. So that means basically you're spending more on workers' comp than you should be. Anytime you're less than that, that's a good thing. That means you're, you're saving, you know, you're doing, doing better. So the good news is right now, the town of Heartland is at a 0.81, so it's well below that one, one mod. Did you know that? I think you told me. I think I might have told you that. I, and actually, um, so that's that's a good thing. Um, and I got it right here. Um, so when was that calculated? Um, usually late summer, before you get your um, renewal package. Pat information. So theoretically, it would have included those two events that we had this past year. No. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so basically, you're at a, you, you, you've been this year. You're at a point eight one, which is great. I mean, that's well below your average, which is super. That means you're saving literally thousands of dollars. And for 2020, it's at a point eight one. So anytime you have so it's saying the same, which is you're going to have another good year in 2020. So your question is, well, we just had two in the last year or so. So what happens is, that, simply put, what happens is these the claim comes on and it stays on your kind of, for the lack of a better term, stays on your record for three years until it drops off. So every year, the previous fourth year is dropping off, and anything that is new comes on, but like 20, but it doesn't include the immediate first calendar year. They have to let that play out for the life of that claim to see how it's gonna, because some of these linger on for, you know, who knows how long. 
And so, all the more reason for a designated provider is because sometimes you can get more rather lightweight. Um, and that's it's good to have control over in that way too. So you won't see them happen like the one this year, a couple this year, 2019. So them lack them won't actually come onto that three year cycle until January 1, 2021. And then they'll stay with you for that three years. So, the, but the good news here is that you're at a point eight one. You don't, as Amanda said, you don't have a history of a lot of claims here, which is good, but, uh, but excellent, which you know says a lot about your staff and obviously people are, you know, safety conscious and whatnot, which is good. Um, but by having by by now establishing this down the road, I mean it can. It's just one more tool that you have to help keep that mod. You know, at or below a one moving forward. Okay. And it, you know, the good news is it doesn't cost you anything. There's no fee. It's just it's just uh, putting the programs in place and having somebody make sure that you know when somebody does get hurt, that it happens that they're following the program. Can I follow up on the medical provider question? Um, I'm I'm confused as I read this uh, with the use of occupational health person versus medical provider. Uh, is this a medical provider who specializes in occupational health? Yeah, we call them designated medical provider. Okay. In a perfect world, it would be an occupational health specialist or occupational health person or, or doc or whatever. The unfortunate part is we don't have you know, many of our towns, especially in down this neck of the state, and further south where I'm from, we don't have, a, there's more now than there used to be, but we don't have a lot of them specialty folks around to, to choose from. So, uh, I, But there are a few more, so, you that, know, that's, that's And I know you've been interviewing, which is good, and we'll hear about that later, I'm sure. Um, can I think of it, this as, uh, this is a case manager that's going to be working with who this person sees or doesn't see as far as recovery of, from that injury? The, 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 the provider would be, yeah, in a, in a sense, they're like a case manager because you got one person focusing with the affected employee right. and working directly with you know, management here, wherever that may, you know, may be, right. to just. Right. And in this day and age of uh, many people choosing alternate medical treatments, um, uh, if I understand again what's written, that would be allowed under this procedure if that provider. That's correct, yeah. Okay. If you establish this, and basically, if, if, you know, if, if a result of all this is you end up with a designated provider for municipal, your municipal employees, yeah. then the program would require the affected employee to go to your provider at least the first time. Mm -hmm. And then after that, if they choose to, for whatever reason that they want to go see their own provider or a different one or whatever the case might be, they have that option and there's a particular form they have to sign, like a waiver or whatever it is, to get the actual name of it. But there's a form they have to sign saying, no, there's something different. But nine times out of ten what happens is what we find is that if you have an injured employee, they go to your provider, nine times out of ten they stay with that person, everything's done in house and just helps control the costs and get that person back to work sooner, sooner than later. And who decides the TRTW piece of it? Is that the Heartland team that would be involved with um, deciding when that person would return to work and what the duties would be? No. Well, I mean, the, certainly you would have a say in it. The manager would have a say in it or you know, supervisor or whatever. Yeah. But no, that would be like if you have a trend, if you have a return to work program, um, then you know there's going to be you know if an injured person gets they get hurt they go there and maybe you know the result is they can work you know 15 hours a week for the next two weeks. So within their restrictions that are placed on them based on their injury. Okay. Uh, so by having that return to work program in place, your injured your provider knows that will know that and. Typically, ideally, what ha would happen ahead of time is it would be some type of, you know, as part of that policy, there would be some a list drop of, okay, here are some things that we could, 
you know, that we'd like to get done, that we'd never have time for, or other people to do it, that, you know, yeah, maybe they can't drive a truck all on gravel for the next three days or the next week, but there might be a handful of other things they could do, that things sure. just never find time, seem find time to, to do them. So it's good to have that list just ready to go. If you have it ready to go as part of the policy, then yes, it's, it's more apt to happen. Yeah. Then if you don't, then what we find sometimes it's easy, it's easy for, to just say, well, we don't have any light duty. Well, in the, in, in, in quite honestly, yeah, there are, there's times when that's the answer. I mean, sometimes you won't have anything uh, that will fulfill that, that part of it. But more often than not, you've probably got something somewhere, even if it's for a limited amount of time. I was wondering um, how the insurance works, so the workers' comp works, if it's a catastrophic injury that maybe costs a huge amount of money. This, this, in most cases, this wouldn't apply for like a catastrophic type incident, but this designated provider program. Um, well, I'm thinking that a person could get seriously injured on a job and it would fall under workers' comp. Oh, no, it definitely would, but it wouldn't fall under your. It would be outside, at that point, it would be out, an incident like that it would be outside of the realm of your designated provider yeah. program. These are for the, this would be for the, the things that you see uh, the most uh, of. I was more thinking about the, how it affects the uh, town's rates and so forth. If, if, uh, that's a good question. I'm not an expert on that, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, it depends on the incident, the frequency, the severity. And it also depends on there's certain for certain types of things under the workers' comp rules and regs. So some things are a lot of that. A lot of them issues have caps because yeah. in, in many, many cases, I mean, if it was a catastrophic thing, they have to be capped at how much you're going to pay or how much it's going to affect you. Because in some cases, it, you know, you just towns wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Um, so there's a cap to a lot of these. Uh, that's something like our workers' comp. Peggy, uh, I could I could get more information for you on that particular question. If you'd like, Peggy would be the one. Well, that's the good thing to know. Are you interested in how much it would it be beneficial to the employee, or how it would be detrimental to the employer? It would have to be both of those, <coughs> both yeah. of those things. Yeah, and and uh, if if we have a if we should have such an incident, who does pay beyond? Where our cap is, do we have insurance that covers cap? Yeah. Do we have more insurance. And, I, and again, I don't know what the caps are under the workers' comp rules or regs for catastrophic incidents or claims. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and I have one more question. Want to? Okay. Slightly on topic, but a little off topic is it, you could potentially be liable to some sort of a lawsuit as well as part of that mm -hmm. catastrophic sure. thing, in which case it would probably fall under yet another avenue within the insurance program uh, yeah. to, to defend ourselves from that. So, uh, one thing I read, in, uh, if I read it right, was that every emergency visit requires an ambulance ride. Is that right? No. From us? No. What I read here was that if a person is going to get it gets injured, and it means a trip to the emergency room, that it has to be by ambulance. Is that true? Well, it's probably best practice. If you have an employee that gets hurt on the job, gets hurt on the job, and they're injured to the extent where it's that severe or that bad, then yes, they probably ought to be well, going via ambulance. But I don't know of any requirement that says that. No, well, I hope not. I mean, it's quite possible they could cut their finger and they need six stitches. Right, there's exactly. No reason, there's no reason that needs the yeah. ambulance right. And in that, exactly, and that's part of the reason for the designated provider program, because in that scenario, even technically, even if they needed six stitches, you know, that might be, there would be nothing wrong with going to the ER, but. Well, if, if, I think you'd need to go to the ER, but if you, some, you could but, do it in uh, your own car or, or somebody's car. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that happens. I mean, but I don't know of any uh, requirement that actually says you have to go via yeah. ambulance. It's kind of the way I read it. Anyway. 
But fit, uh, I understand the ambulance or non-ambulance part, but are you saying that if the person has got that slash across their hand, they have to go see the designated medical provider? No. As opposed to, no. okay, I didn't think no. you were saying that, no. but I no. want to be clear. Um, no, but I can tell you that we've had other towns who I know that they've had injured employees get a cut on their hand or their arm and they need three or four stitches, and they've gone to their designated provider in town yeah. that they've established sure. because they're capable of doing, you know, a certain level of them type types of services, and and they're perfectly, you know, happy with that. And at the end of the day, uh, they got taken care of, and the cost to you to the employer is, you know, a fraction of the cost of going to the ER either by personal vehicle or an ambulance. Let me just read here. This says on the medical treatment. I found this. It says, number three, it says, in cases where emergency medical treatment is required, the local ambulance slash EMS or 911 shall be called and the injured employee shall be taken to the appropriate emergency medical facility. So any common sense, please, you know, no, accurate so. here? That's like, yeah, that's I, like, I, I what that it, is, is that something, that's, basically that's best practice. I mean, we're not, we're not, nobody's going to say, you know, yeah, take them in the car. Does that happen? It happens probably every day somewhere. Is it best practice? Probably not. Uh, again, depending on the severity of the injury mm. and, you know, whether the person's finger's hanging off or it just needs two stitches. Please. Severed four fingers off of his hand. You may want to call yeah, first responders. So I think that that's kind of. I think that's kind of. A, 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 uh, I do know somebody who <coughs> picked his fingers up three at oh, least yeah. three fingers and drove himself in. So. Oh yeah, no, that happens. I mean, <laughs> we all know those. I, I just hope, people, <coughs> I'm just hoping there's some judgment allowed. Hey, oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we have, I've had some towns that have implemented this, and sometimes they've had things that should have gone to their work designated provider, and they didn't because the employee, the employee you know, they knew, but they didn't think of it. Mm. So they just went to the ER. Mm. So things like that do occur. I mean, it's probably not a perfect system, but it's, you know, the intent is there to make it as best we can. It's just an example, for instance, in the case that uh, with me that happened early in the summer, it was kind of a case of, you know, okay, he came in, you know, on a Monday morning, it was like, my knee really hurts, it's really swollen, what do you want me to do about it? And the answer was kind of, well, you know, kind of like, want me to go to the emergency room, was that for sure, fine, go ahead. Um, <coughs> and um, it's probably actually not even the, the best place to go with that injury. Um, we did visit, and again, we can talk about this in a little bit, a couple of different places. Um, both of them would be fine for, you know, analyzing it and giving some sort of a, you know, making a recommendation as to who they need, then need to go to, mm -hmm. or to kind of come up with an, a, an analysis there as to what's going on and kind of set some sort of a um, plan and, um, you know, it doesn't take that drastic step of actually going to an emergency room. But in both cases, actually, that have happened this summer, I don't think either one was really an emergency room situation. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> More questions? Uh, just a, I have a, a few questions, but I don't know if they're appropriate at, at this time. I'm not sure where we're going on this. Are we ultimately this evening making a, a decision to implement the, the paperwork that you see here? I think for tonight it was, uh, so I've introduced it. Um, we don't need you to essentially ratify it tonight. I think that we wanted to bring it to you in a more formal setting. Yep. I think that we can hone in on the language of the policies a little bit um, at, a, at a future meeting. Um, you know, I think that um, <coughs> Three or four of them had been written based upon the BLCT language. I think it would probably be good for Allison, myself, and uh, Martin to sit down a little bit and talk about those and what we do and don't like about it, whether okay. they can be shortened a little bit. Sure. And then 
put it back out to you as some policies that we would like you to implement. Okay, great. Um, um, from a, uh, a, a general perspective, um, rather than have names in here like C. Dave, um, I, I think we should make the document more global, see the town manager and then parens currently Dave, that sort of thing, so these can stand the test of time. Um, the second thought I had is um, we dismissed because of our size the need for um, a safety committee. Um, I forget the exact language or what, what that was called. So I'm just wondering, um, do, do we have within the town highway department uh, something that Bill or yourself would, do we have uh, training from a safety perspective on, on an annual basis, um, you know, checking equipment, uh, make sure everyone is, uh, has their vests or has this or knows how to operate machinery. We go through some of that um, is it to the extent as, you know, to the nth degree, the answer probably no. Um, and I'm on the live camera, but I'll say it anyways, you know, from a bullshit perspective, are we where we need to be? The answer probably no. Yeah. Um, you know, there's always a whole lot more you can do, so I think that there's more to do. Mm -hmm. You know, can I pull Bill or the highway crew or, or you know, department heads once a month and sit down and talk about this and implement it? Um, you know, I think some of that's probably something we can do maybe at a, at a, at a staff meeting or, or look at this in a little bit different way. Right. I think, you know, uh, I, I think to get this in place and just have it a little bit more formal and to start thinking about this is a good step for us. Um, and look towards, um, you know, and again, I think that uh, one thing that we don't do is a follow-up kind of survey with the employee is to, okay, what, you know, how can we prevent this from happening again? Um, that's something that kind of happens at, you know, the meeting, you know, the larger meeting type stuff. And, um, I would prefer to go that way at this point in time rather than, you know, getting people in and, and um, look, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, we have, 13 full-time employees and we'd end up with most of them there. Um, you know, maybe we can employ it at a, at a staff meeting, but, um, you know, we'll look at that, I think, down the road. Okay. Frequency town. Can you say which is which one is a high frequency town? Or is that confidential? It's confidential, but typically our larger members with you know yeah, more or use with more employees. Which you said you had a total of what thirteen? Full time. We full, full time, yeah. We have maybe twenty eight full and part time. Twenty eight full and part time in the summertime, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Actually sounds like a I'm going to date myself an old Joni Mitchell song where she talks about the high frequency radio stations. But anyway. <laughs> but that's got to, I mean, that's got to all be, uh, I mean, it, it's got to be all like per capita, right? I mean, it can't be that just because they're a big town that they receive a right. poor rating, just, I mean. Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I have some larger towns that have a mod rating, you know, similar to yours, yeah. which is good. Yeah. Some that aren't so good. But yeah, so like I said, but right now your mod, your work is not mod, is excellent. Yeah, but it's going to go up in a year and a half. Why are you doing it? Well, I'm just, I mean, we can't ignore these, these uh, incidents. They're, they are going to affect us. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're going to have some effect. Now, my gut feeling is, and I don't know this for sure, but, you know, it, it'll probably be minimal. Uh -huh. You know, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Because it was, 
again, frequency. I mean, you, you don't have a lot of them, so. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it remains to be seen on that part of it, but. <coughs> so you're good with me? You want me? We're all set? Good way, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, wait, before you go, take a quick one. <coughs> Trip. My trip's not that far. Oh, good. Oh, well, for him. <laughs> it's only 30 minutes. Oh, really? No, it wants to. Okay. Alright, thank you. Good night. Yeah. Okay, so we could do the uh, <coughs> CJs here. The Planning Commission. What one does that go? Uh, so I'm going to. I'm. I'm kind of in the loop on this, but uh, I'm going to let Jay introduce the, um, the the candidate and speak on her behalf. And um, uh, I don't know if I can speak on her behalf. I can. We uh, the planning commission is down to five members. We, uh, our bylaws um, say that we should have nine. We haven't had nine members in probably four or five years. Um, so with Dave's passing, we went from six to seven, although one member hasn't shown up in years, so we need to do something about that. So at our last planning commission, um, a woman came unannounced. And so before the meeting, <clears throat> oh, let me digress a minute. There was time before the meeting because it takes me at least 10 minutes to unlock the door at the Rock Rec Center. So we have to find somebody to pick the lock or a hammer to take the hinges off the door. If somebody could take care of that, that would be much appreciated. But in that case, the benefit of having time before, as I, I just got to talk to her. I asked her uh, where she was from and, uh, and was she coming with the Energy Committee? And she said no, she was just there. I, she didn't say kicking tires, but I thought maybe that's what it was all about. So uh, she was... Um, uh, her name is Rebecca. She's uh, uh, Craig the Lister's significant other. She's from North, she's from North Heartland. Um, I I had heard about her in time. Just said that she was a, a bright woman, and so she stayed for the meeting, asked a few questions, and at the meeting was attempting to leave before I could latch on to her to ask her if she wanted to be a member, and she said yes. So what that's the first. Gordon. Rebecca Gordon. Yeah, I, I know Rebecca, but in fact, I would recommend her to be considered for this position. And I think with her architectural background uh, and just desire to be active in town, I think she'd be a great fit. Yeah, yeah that's, we, we gathered that too. So we're here tonight in support of her being appointed to a member, which will bring us up really to seven. We're actually thinking of changing our bylaws to make it a seven-person commission rather than nine-person. Uh, but that's yet to because be Because it would be easier for quorum? Or? Yeah, we have, we, have, we have a tough time with quorum sometimes. And, uh, um, yeah. So that's the planning commission business. So she would be number seven? She would be number seven, but very soon we're going to be down to Yes, it doesn't make it too much. Yes. off? Well, we we need to we need to notify the person or, or talk to him and just see what the story is. In, in which case, um, uh, I talked to Roger Shepard, uh, and uh, we thought that maybe with a little bit of help rather than a general advertisement that we could ask. Uh, Peter Gregory thought he might know somebody. So if, if you know somebody, let us know, and we'll invite him to a planning commission meeting and go from there. Or we'll just invite somebody ourselves. We do like to talk to him. We like them to come to the meeting just to see what they're getting into. Puts us on our best behavior. Too. So we need a motion. Uh, I make a motion that uh, we nominate Rebecca Gordon. Appoint. Appoint uh, Rebecca Gordon to be a member of the 
Town Planning Commission. I'll second. Okay. Good to go. Good. Well, thank you. Actually, I should have said probably, you know, we like to have membership, planning commission membership that's where people who live in different parts of town. We oh, have, yeah. haven't oh. been able to find anybody from North Harvest. That's true. Mm -hmm. And there hasn't been a woman on the planning commission for probably 10 years, so, yeah. Be nice to her. Yeah. <laughs> Do our best. <laughs> Thank so you. When are you doing that tour in. Oh, is it? Yeah. Sunday. This, uh, Saturday, Saturday. this coming Saturday? Yeah. Okay. Bye, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> that was easy. I'm talking about the tractor now. I like talking about tractors. <coughs> Great. So Bill is here to talk about the tractor. Um, we did communicate with uh, various entities. Got four back. Um, the preference, uh, my understanding, is for the John Deere. 117,963. But I'll let Bill expand on the discussion at all. Um, anything you want to add as far as um, what you like about it or what you what you came across or just talk about the process a little bit and your, why you like the John Deere? Um, well, it wasn't the, the brand per se, it was the, the dealership the quickest to respond and give me a quote on a new tractor. Being a John Deere is pretty handy since we can get you know, parts pretty down the road here, yeah. pretty close by. Mm -hmm. uh, we've dealt with Fairfields before, the other office we've never, never uh, had any experience dealing with. Fairfields have built quite a few dump trucks for us in the past. Where are you? No. Morrisville. But the, uh, there's a John Deere dealership right down the road. That's not the case. Then we we're still familiar with the John Deere, yeah. the construction deal. I don't know if they sell. I mean, we're talking oil filters, um, well, those kind of things like that. Get from yeah. yeah, anything major, we probably have to um, send it back up to the, the big deal or you know up there, but just for regular routine maintenance. And so I'm hoping with a brand new one, we won't have anything but routine maintenance to really should deal with it anyway. So how many how many horsepower though? What's that? How many horsepower? That one is... Yeah. Doesn't say, does it? I, I don't know. It doesn't say I'm going to... Between 90 and 100, I think, is what it was. I looked it up, Bill. It was supposed to be 105. The thing that perplexes me and I compared it, I talked about the weight, and the other tractors were all less than 10,000 pounds, and this one was supposed to be 14,000 pounds fully ballasted. Is that, is it really that heavy? Do you know the answer to that? I don't, th they have to, well they have to be that heavy. I don't know if these other ones, that was the other part too, is that is dealing with these guys, I don't know if they're going to add, when they add the mower on, if they have to put more real weights on the other side anyway, or you know, the balance underneath it too. Um, this is the hard part we're doing this, is that, I don't know anything about tractors. Just, you know, this is new to me, so basically going blind, I don't even know how much horsepower we need to do, or anything like that, or how big I had to be, or anything. That's why I went with, well, I put it out there to a bunch of dealers, and Fairfield is the one that answered me first, and, Basically said, yeah, yeah, we still, we still, still sell roadside tractors, and here it is. Well, you so do we know, went off of that. 
you do know that if you're going to hang a mower up 22 feet away, you're going to have something fairly heavy to yeah. hit you to. <laughs> yeah. Just keep it on the ground. Yeah. yeah. So, I have a basic question. A couple of basic questions. How long is it going to take to mow the roadsides? How long to mow them? My plan would be to mow from May to November. So you're going to keep it going? Yes. Okay. We're over the years we've been, we haven't got everything completed over the years because of the tractor we have. It's spent so much time not mowing. So. Does can, that mean another employee to run it? Well, we could always use another employee. No. But uh, we could just keep somebody in it. That would just mean somebody's going to be in it. Oh, yes. You know, we can, either way, we figure out something to run it. Yeah, another, another guy running a big guy doing it. The whole plan would be, regardless of who's running it, somebody's going to be in it all summer long, all the time. Until we can get caught up. We think we've got a couple of years to go before we can get things caught up and get things put back to where they were, where they belong. How old is that current tractor? It's a 1987, I believe. Wow. Dave, have you considered uh, subbing the job out to somebody else that already owns the tractor? Uh, we have batted that back and forth uh, quite a bit. <coughs> uh, I think in the short to medium term, I think we have got to find a balance on some of the other things that we need to subcontract out, being the ditching and the uh, uh, culverts and some of the other work. I don't think we've quite found that balance yet. Um, so I don't think we're quite ready to do that with the mowing at this point. And I think that um, if Bill brings up a good point, it, when I was in Burke, they put it out to bid, and uh, the bid came back as a, as a kind of a one lap, I'll call it, or, you know, if you want me to do two cuts, kind of the second lap. <coughs> um, my understanding, initially, we've kind of done at least one and a half when we're capable of doing that. Uh, they do the, the payment first, um, then they do the back roads, and they kind of go back and do some of the payment. <coughs> Last couple of years, uh, my understanding is, is that we haven't been able to do that, so we are kind of behind, and, and it will probably take a little bit. Plus, um, if you are going to contract it out, just know that they are going to keep their head down, and they're going to mow. Um, exactly what there is to mow. Um, we have more than several places that um, like to be individualized and do not like their places cut. And we run into, um, for better for worse, we run into some colorful discussions on whether we're going to cut it or not. Um, I'm not sure if we contract that out. The colorful discussion is going to take place. Um, so I think that um, for the short to medium term, I think that we are comfortable mowing it ourselves. Um, that's not to say down the road um, we're not open to looking at that. Um, but I see that down the road a few years. Um, another question is, um, I see that this calls for a rotary mower, it's like a bush hog. Yep. What is the on the tractor now that you have used? You got a flail mower on what we have now. I'm sorry, but you, you do have a flail mower now? Yep. So it wouldn't be a big deal to change the head to a different kind of mower. You, you mean if we wanted to put a flail mower on it? Yeah. Well, it cost several thousand dollars to buy a flail mower head, but I realize that. I don't. Uh, I don't know how much. Well, how difficult it would be. I don't think it would be difficult. Uh, the, the rotary mower is going to be put in this brush to cut. But if you have good luck and actually do get all the way around town cutting all the brush and, and you get the road sides to grass, the rotary mower is not necessarily what you want from that point on. Well, that's what we had. On the old, this this mower we have now is probably ten years old, but for yeah. the 
20 years before that, it was a, a regular brush hunt. Yeah. And we ended up renting one. The town used to rent a, a big more similar to this one here, and we're trying to price out with a brush hog head on it, too. Up until eight years, ten years ago, we always had the brush hog head. We've never had to flip more. And we find now that that thing, when you get it too close to stone walls or guardrails and other things, the, the teeth on that don't yeah. take it as well as the regular brush, well. brush hog blade. Yeah. I know you have a lot of stones and things to deal with. You may be picking up rocks on yep. the side of the road and putting them somewhere. Rocks <laughs> and beer bottles and everything else, yeah. Is this tractor four wheel drive? Yep. Does it need to be? You know, I asked the same thing and they, they say yes because of just a heavier freight on it. Following up on the four wheel drive, um, Is there a use for the tractor in the other three months that you aren't mowing, or four months or five months? If you get, if you get okay. a mid. I found this on the web for tractor. Check it out. <laughs> he wasn't Sorry. asking you, Billy. He was asking his phone. No, it's just a John Deere. <laughs> I upgraded my operating system last night. Good question. Uh, wait, wait. He was saying something. You try to get a leaf blower. This is a mid-mounted tractor. We should still be able to use a three-point hitch. Yeah. Put it. Maybe get one of those uh, those PTO driven leaf blowers. Okay. Back. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Yeah. What else? <laughs> Four, four feet is awfully narrow for mowing. I mean, I I know I'm, I'm used to mowing twice that with our uh, weed mower, and half again is not. I mean, like we have eight, eight feet on the this mower that we mow pastures with, and ten feet on the field mower. So it would be hard to imagine doing only four feet. Because effectively, you don't even get four feet. You get more like three feet. Oh, you're talking as far as the width of the deck? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. It, it's, but I understand for roadsides, because you want to fit things, that, it's, that you probably yeah. don't want more than that. But no, and then you know, and that's the, the whole point of having a, a decent tractor that you can yeah. rely on to just keep going. You do yeah. one, do one, do, yeah. do two rows, do three swaths if you can, when we can. And yeah, it takes a lot longer, but. We haven't even had time to do all of them, you know what I'm saying? We haven't done probably half of the, the back roads. The tractor spent so much time in the shop. Yeah. Is that going to get traded in or um, sold or what? What's that? The old tractor. What's happening with the old tractor? Scrap metal. Well, the tires are falling off. The, they go flat. Um, so the, the wheel that kind of broke apart, is, we, we, we didn't fix that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we did and get it going back out again, and then, you know, it blew something in one of the hydraulic closes, and the three point hitch doesn't keep it up in the air. It's just, it's just really old and tired. Would it be use, useful to keep it for just as a backup? Or no? Is it really scrap? Yeah, it's pretty well gone. It's beyond that. Beyond scrap? Well, beyond a backup. I mean, if you've got to spend 8000 I mean, to take the chance for that repair just for a few days of right. and, and when operation, it's not the, worth it. The break this summer was metal fatigue. <coughs> and that's the Ooh. Right the wall. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Yeah. So town line and try to get back to you with the price? No. Right. And because you know, I started talking with them, you know, way back when about getting one and trying to get the other one not on that we had, and um, then I reached out to Dan Rancy actually, who's the new was our in-house tractor expert. He sent me to the other ones, and one of the other salesmen that I usually deal with for dump truck bodies just gave me the, the names of the the dealers, you know, the actual manufacturers, and tried it through that way. And that's how we came up with the other ones besides. Howard Fairfields, which does you know, dump truck mm -hmm. municipal equipment. I don't think trailers can sell these big tractors. They have to have some kind of a 
sort of franchise to do it. Well, well that, but these other dealers also are dealers with the mowers too. Yeah. The, yeah. So. Are you going to talk to the county side of this? <coughs> what would you like to know? You're going to finance it or pay for it? Plenty of pay for it. Um, so, in your packets, you got um, what, as of today, and we haven't gotten out of that, what the equipment fund looks like. Um, last year, at this very same time, <coughs> excuse me. Last year at this time, this is what we were projecting. <coughs> so we're about $30,000 off. So ori originally we had budgeted like fifty to 55000 for a tractor. Um, and we just kind of had um, guesstimated uh, at one point, a couple, two years ago, when we were budgeting. We did talk about that. Um, so it's 117, so that's quite a bit more. However, both 10 wheelers were less than um, we expected. Um, we had budget 200,000, and um, we had a <coughs> excuse me, paying like 140 something for uh, the 10 wheeler, predominantly because we had a trade in uh, value on that. So last year, I was projecting um, at the end of 2020, which this would be um, purchased in the fiscal year 2020. I was anticipating about $188,000 being left for a fund balance. Uh, if we continue moving forward uh, in this direction, and the rec band uh, that we also have scheduled for this year um, holds true at about 25. We use this with about 151, 355 um, for a fund balance. Uh, so that's a thirty thousand dollar difference, um, which is, um, you know, considering it was kind of a, a guess, it's not too far off. Um, however, overall, I think we'll probably end up looking at the fund balance and upping that a little bit because 180 or 150 makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, you know, going into, we'll need to get um, the front end loader and we'll need to get another six loader um, in the very not too distant future. I think we're planning on the loader first and then the six wheeler in Bill's truck or used to be Bill's truck. Um, but we're also putting in about 145, 149,000 a year into the equipment fund. So, you know, you need to keep that in, in mind. So we've got these expenses and we're also feeding it with about 149,000. Um, I think that we need to look at upping that amount uh, a little bit over the next couple of years. To what? I can't answer that yet. Um, I think that when I, in 2016 or 17, um, and again, you did it a little bit differently at that point in time, you just, we were keeping track of all the, essentially I'll call them operational expenses, you were keeping track of all the maintenance and fuel and stuff in the equipment fund, which is, was hard to kind of track. We pulled that out and it's actually in the actual um, highway fund at this point in time. So we're looking at that. Uh, we used to put in a number, we just used to put in a revenue number into the equipment fund. Um, it was upwards to about 315000 at one point in time. Uh, and then uh, two years ago when I came on and we started to up other parts of the budget, we cut the equipment fund a little bit. Uh, actually down to about 290 or so. Uh, and I think it needs to come up to about that 315 number. Um, again, that was just what was going into it. It was hard to tell how much was actually going towards future purchases because, again, that, that maintenance and, and fuel charges were all in the equipment fund, and, and, and now we're just looking at a number that's going into the equipment fund itself and for future purchases. So right now it seems to be about 149,000 that we're putting into future purchases, and I think that, that could go up 
ten to twenty thousand um, dollars for their funds. We seem to be self-sustaining at this point in time, but I think we need to get back to a bit of a cushion. I mean, again, look at the purchase that we've made over the past three years. You know, we purchased the one ton of two ten wheelers. Um, that's pretty significant. Um, so, um, you know, we're essentially over the course of five years, we're going to revamp our almost our entire fleet. So, um, we'll need to do that again. You know, once we get through this five years, we'll, we've got like, you know, we're going to need to start redoing it. So we need to kind of replenish that to get to where we need to go. So how much did you say those one, those ten wheelers were? One hundred and fifty. So it is on the uh, the first one that I gave you uh, in, in your actual handout in your packets. Mm -hmm. um, it was one hundred and fifty-five, three fifty-seven, and one forty-three, eight sixty-nine. And I believe that included the warranties with those. With that amount, um, again, the one forty-three, eight sixty-nine. We got a pretty decent trade-in value on that ten wheeler that was that been towed away a couple times prior to that. But um, I don't remember what we got on, on uh, the old ten wheeler there on, on skips. Forty-five. Forty-five. We got a pretty decent trade-in for what it was ten, ten years old. It was. Yep. We hope to turn them around a little bit quicker and get a little bit more of a trade-in value on them um, and not get to the point where we're towing them away and we have to, um, again, we got a pretty decent trade-in on that. But, um, so again, are you asking us to this one I would like to make it, it's your definitive voice. We, we'd like to move forward with the purchase. Will it be, will it be available by spring? Yes. Does Hartford have this more? Do you know, do you know anybody else who has this the same setup or not? Nope. You don't. And is that one seventeen? You mentioned warranty. Is that is there some sort of? I'm sure there's a warranty with the tractor itself, and maybe even more. But the the uh, the one from Fairfield is the tractor three year on everything and one year on the mower. disc is actually a type of flat, flat way. This is not a, a rotor, or is this a rotary? It's a rotary. It is a rotary. <coughs> Bill, this, I don't know if this is a nice question or not, but will this mower mostly stay on the ground? Is this going to get tipped up on the edge and cut it? You should, you should pretty much cut anywhere you want. No, but I'm asking, how is it going to be used? Oh, how is it going to be used? Yeah. I mean, that's um, depends on who you talk to. A rather unsightly way to a cut brush. Well, depending on who you talk to, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then in a couple of weeks or so, you will sometimes you even know. Well, in a, a year, it disappears. But. We don't want to go go out. Uh, making any more enemies than they already have. But in a lot of places you could get, get stuff right back there. And there's, it's not just, you know, we're not gonna sweep the trees, just smash a brush back. But there's a lot of places with um, bushes and other heavy duty stuff that can be just taken back. It can also reach over the guardrails and mm. places where we usually gotta send a guy out with a string trimmer yeah. on the side of the road. So, 
So that, that's what I'm thinking. It's just more versatile for what we, we haven't been getting mm -hmm. done. Yeah. So what are you saying? What's your objection? Well, you see it done, and this has a capability of cutting the limbs off trees. Um, because it can be operated vertically as well as, it doesn't have to stand the ground. No, but they just do it like this, I mean, along a bank. They're not putting it up into a tree, right? And you can. But they, but you don't. But we could. But you don't. Maybe along the lower end of Clay Hill Road. Oh. <laughs> I want to make a motion that we buy the, the uh, John Deere tractor from HP Fairfield. Uh, you just made that motion? Yep. All second motion. One favor. That sounds like a good idea. Now that I know all the facts. You with it? You good for it, Phil? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We gotta go. Thank you. Yeah, happy. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I hope it lasts a long time and you're happy with it. It's still looking really shiny on the 4th of July parade. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Yeah, have a good night. So we're down to the budget stuff for this day. September, uh, the numbers that you have in front of you. So that's uh, three months out of 12, 25%. So you have the percentage spent on the, uh, the front of the right hand column. Um, so far to date, uh, the general fund is running below 25%. Just get the glasses. handout, which is general fund expenses. Um, I'm going to kind of keep a general overview. So um, the general fund itself is running at about 23%, 23.28%. If I back out both the appropriations, most of the appropriations have been paid, with the exception of just half of the fire department. Uh, the rest of them have been paid. And a good number of the, uh, the assessments uh, as well in that category have been paid as well. So that's all kind of front end, front end loaded, which kind of throws the percentage off. So if I back those out completely and just essentially leave the operating expenses, mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty good tail of where we're at. Uh, again, we haven't made any of our large insurance payments. Um, and when we do, we'll, we'll let you know. Two things to highlight here, health insurance. Uh, if anybody's been following uh, the news, um, NDP 10.1% or 10.3, Blue Cross Blue Shield is upwards to 12 and above. Percentage increase for 2020. We budgeted about a 5% increase for health insurance um, which actually kind of goes against the way I do things, but um, uh, you know, that's what we went with. We went with a 5% increase, so you're going to see um, that's going to apply some pressure to our expenses uh, for the second half of the year, January through June. Uh, you'll see that. Uh, last year we had a benefit on this. Uh, we basically budgeted for a higher increase than what we saw and that worked to our benefit. This year it's gonna work against us. Um, the second thing I would like to point out is the 21 house has sold. It sold for, well, sold for $175,000. Um, the check to us once you take out Expenses to lawyers and to realtors and to 
all the good folks involved. Uh, the check to us was for $164,226.97. Um, what, so that will go into revenue. Um, what we will, and what you've already signed off on, is to pay off the remaining loan, which is $149,580. So, <coughs> so that's about a $15,000 differential um, in our favor. Uh, but what we also raised tax money for was a 38,000, basically a $39,000 payment to the bank. Um, so you have both the tax money for that payment there that was raised, plus the income from the sale of the house going against that 149,580. So you really have about a 40, 50, $55,000 swing in there. Uh, that we will need to decide at some point when the dust settles, probably when we get an audit, probably next year at this point in time when we figure out where this will land. And I think that by the end of June, July, we can have kind of a, an idea of how we ended up budget-wise uh, when you want to set the tax rate, but certainly you'll have some decisions there to make. It adds a little bit of a cushion to, you know, the health insurance and some other issues that we may have. <coughs> However, that's some, you know, something that you need to consider towards the end of the year and, and what you want to do with that. The deficit that we have currently also will play into that um, because obviously it's tough to do anything with or give money back if you have a deficit and anything that would probably go towards alleviating that deficit, um, which is why this year's audit and where we ended up was also important in honing in on that number. So what I'm really telling you is you have the sale of the house, you've got you know some extra revenue in there. Um, you'll probably need to make a decision, but we need to see how this year's audit plays out and what our deficit looks like and how much we close the gap with those delinquencies, um, and then how this budget year actually ends up. So just basically just telling you that and to keep it in mind. Highway department is running um, essentially where it should be. Uh, again, we're gonna underspend on some of the paving because we made that big payment in June. We did our paving in June prior to this fiscal year, so we ran higher deficit last year's fiscal year um, than we did this year. Uh, over the course of the two years, it'll kind of even out. It's kind of some big picture stuff there, but um, kind of in a nutshell, if you have any specific detailed questions, let me know. So we should be okay. 12, 10, well, whatever it is, 10, 12% increase in insurance versus the five percent we budget because we have this cushion the answer is kind of yes yeah. it doesn't make life easy i think we probably could navigate it but um you know it's just 10 percent increases just don't help no it's horrible I don't know how they get away with that, honest to God. We don't have enough time. <laughs> Admittedly, kind of a mistake on my, I generally usually budget 8 to 10 percent and um, Anyway, budget and five. Was this my fault? Is that what you're trying to say? I may have been feeling some outward pressure. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, this one was. Uh, <sighs> I'm feeling the pressure myself. Well, uh, internally, I kind of got. We've 
we'll go back to the eight to ten percent on basically a yearly basis. I mean, Tom and I have kind of talked about they kind of you guys go with it's kind of the same. Mm -hmm. Most people go with that same concept, but they they lulled us into this sense of comfort for a couple of years. They kind of kept things stable for a little bit, and now we're back to back to some chaos. So like after after the Obama years and that kind of settled out, prices stabilized for a little bit, and but now we're seeing. A some, crisis? Some craters with mm -hmm. the political climate and a couple other things. So, expenses, they shot up. Could be worse. The school says, I saw the school health system was up like 14% or something. The, 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 the group benefit plan that the, the schools use, I think it's up 14%. Read so, it's not. Questions? Nope. I guess a general one that's been scaring me is uh, it looks like the legal expenses are pretty moderate right now. Um, we're kind of right at that average of a quarter. Um, cool. Do we know where things may? I'm not sure if I've been asked this, but what are we doing there? So the only thing I'm going to say is um, <clears throat> municipalities in legal fees these days, um, legal fees tend to run fairly high um, just because of the complexity and the need to make sure that it's done right. Uh, so in general, just the baseline legal fees, I think that um, this is something that we're going to need to get used of. Mm -hmm. As far as what we're seeing from the reappraisal level, it is yet to be seen. Okay. You know, I think that we need to literally give it another six weeks to see you know, your decisions. The BCA decisions are just now coming out. Right. And uh, we'll see what, um, you know, you had. 22, 28 decisions um, that you needed to make at the BCA level. Any one of those individuals has the right to take it to the next level with an appeal. That's their right. Mm -hmm. And um, we therefore need to, you know, make a decision to essentially defend that. So any one of those can go. Um, could be zero, could be 28. Um, we'll wait and see and kind of some will be easier than others. Uh, I'm sure that's okay. kind of kind of it. I think that I think this has been a theme, and I think this was kind of a theme through the BCA process. I think that as the town goes through the reappraisal process and hopefully continues to do consistent assessments, essentially year after year, and reappraisals every few years, that we settle into some normalcy and you know the values are somewhat consistent and it's not you know people come accustomed to the process and what to expect and it's not such a knee-jerk <clears throat> reaction as to okay I've got to fight this or okay this is just something I haven't you know six years ago my value was here and now it's way up here or you know vice versa or you know it's gone every which way um, I think when we have those bumps in the road, I think that it creates, you know, questions in people's minds and they have the right to question it. So okay. hopefully we can, with some consistency here, kind of smooth that out. Mm -hmm. okay. um, generally still see two to three um, out of the process, but uh, certainly hopefully not. Two to three a year? Yeah, not a year, but yeah, um, at least in a reappraisal, going to the next level. Oh, 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 oh. Um, but I think it's important to get to cons some consistency and and some, you know, when the, when the valuations kind of are different. You know, again, we did one 13, 12 years ago. Um, if you're doing them every five years and you're, you're doing continuous 
assessments where you're looking at properties continuously throughout the year with new additions and et cetera, and you're keeping track of the valuation in a consistent manner, then it shouldn't be such surprises. I think that's what we're seeing here. Hopefully, anyways. Okay. I'm going to move on to the uh, your notes. So I think we need to talk about it. Or... FEMA actually did finally officially get submitted. Um, we are working on Mace Hill. The H&H study did come back. Uh, it did recommend a larger uh, structure uh, to that. However, there's some recognition that the stream would need to be altered both before and after. Uh, I'm working with the state of Vermont on this, so it's unclear as to the sizing of a culvert that we'll end up with. But again, I'm working with Chris Bump out of District 4 uh, as to putting out an RFP to the engineers uh, and working with FEMA on that part of it. So that's still, from a FEMA perspective, is still lagging, but the road work that we did has been submitted um, to the higher ups in FEMA, so that part of it is moving along. Where is this cold today? Um, the Four Corners The Four oh, Corners okay. cold. okay. Correct. I thought they couldn't alter a stream. You can, you just gotta talk to the right people. So in order to mess with this culvert, we essentially had to get a permit from the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. And before we can, and as part of that permit process, they essentially telling us what size that culvert needs to be. Mm -hmm as part of the process. So that's kind of where we're at at the moment. So you, you mentioned that before the culvert and after the culvert, the stream was gonna be, had, had to be altered? So they, um, particularly afterwards, so. Where do you move it to? If you, uh, which, was kind of the, which is kind of the question at this point in time. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's four and a half feet by three feet. So it's four and a half feet wide now, three feet tall. It was recommended that it goes seven feet wide, five feet tall, um, or something to that effect. And if you go that wide, then the, on the outlet side, you run into some problems. So. Although they'd both get more flat yard. What's that? They'd have a culvert You'd have to, I would think you'd have to put culverts in between the two houses if you wanted to go that wide, all in between them, wouldn't you? You, I think you just it would have to kind of widen the outlet where, where the culvert, so right now it's, you know, it's stone wall yeah. on both sides. So you would be, it's you would have to, you would just have to open the outlet and funnel it in, kind of, sort of, you know, so that the water coming through will funnel into where you're going. <coughs> you know, what we may end up is some sort of a, like a compromise, you know, like a, a little bit of a smaller structure and less work to the stream. You Will know. they let you do that, though, and pay for it? Um, the there's answer is be, yes. There's got to be exceptions to the circumstances. I thought they were pretty rigid, actually. Well, I know, but I mean, if there's only so much room, there's so much, only so much room. Well, part of the problem is I don't know if the, the FEMA mitigation will actually pay for anything outside the right-of-way. So if you've got to do work to the outlet side, then that could very well be on us. Oh. So what the state of Vermont is saying is, is that based upon the constrictions, you may need to make it smaller, but if you make it smaller than the recommended size, just know that you may run into problems again with with the flow because the, you know it needs to be wide enough for it to get through. So we're at the moment. I'm letting some folks over in District Four kind of mull that over, and um, I'll take some recommendations from them. Mm -hmm. 
sure about our tax out. <laughs> I couldn't hear you. We should have taken it about it at the tax sale. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, that may be a little more than we need, but uh, uh, I think I told you uh, Tim Rockwood and I and Rob Anreg um, met with um, George Burns from uh, Twin State Utilities. Um, the trailer was indeed on our property. Uh, it was fairly clear. Twin State Utilities said that they would move it. We talked about timing of it. He was hoping for, asked me if he could do it next spring. We agreed on July 1st. Um, so I have sent him a letter confirming that. Um, so we'll look at July 1st for him to have that moved by. Uh, a while back, I think I told you about. Okay, but I want to just say thank you because I know the Conservation Commission was really concerned about getting that done just given the 17 acre wood mm -hmm. piece so thank you yeah that's Welcome a this. huge accomplishment some well, well it's not moved yet um, so we'll see but it's in writing but, uh, it's in writing <laughs> it's yeah, um, important thing. yeah I will we've done it it's done you know we met and we've we moved on yeah. um, Um, I think I told you a while back uh, at the activity center, uh, we had still had some water problems with the water coming off the roof overhang onto the front part of the building. Uh, and it was essentially, even with the roof guards on there, still causing problems. Um, we looked at it last spring and kind of through the summer, and essentially the roofing was so kind of mucked up that uh, the roof guards weren't going to work um, regardless. So. <coughs> Josh is uh, over there um, going to be doing the back door at some point. So we had him essentially reshingle the front little overhang there. Uh, that's been done and the roof, um, the, the water guards should work appropriately at this point in time and to essentially protect our interest for what we did last year on that front end. Yeah, that's all I got. Go ahead. It's good. Yeah, that's the end of our list, I guess. So, have we got anything? I'm curious about the designated providers. Uh, so we went to two, I can't remember the first name, Clear Choice or something like that, over on in what, both are in Lebanon. <laughs> Um, the Queer Choice, I think is what it's called, is um, uh, over by the Honda dealership in um, America Mile. And Alice Peck Day had a facility as well. And um, I got to say, the Alice Peck Day facility was, was beautiful. Um, Can Alice Peck Day do anything, though? Be set? Could they do a procedure? Stitches there? Alice yep. Peck, they can. So they had um, right in that facility, right down the, there, yep, right employee. down the hallway, they had orthopedic doctors, they had physical therapy, um, they have a doctor right there on staff. Um, if they can't, they will re simply refer you over to the emergency room and the paperwork and the, and the communication will follow. So if you happen to go in that facility and they're like, okay, this is, you know, we can't do you, <coughs> they can say, essentially put you in a wheelchair and bring you over to the emergency room, which is like 75 yards away. Yeah. If you went to the other one and there was something that they couldn't do, they needed to refer you over to an essentially an emergency room or have you transported or something to that effect. So um, those were the two that we saw. I, I personally clearly thought Alice Peck Day was, was a very good facility. Um, yes, sir. I'd like to make a comment about that. A number of years ago, APD developed a very specific, specific occupational health clinic. Um, Dr. Phil Collins is the head of that particular clinic. They did it actually in partnership with Timken originally. And, and they did some on-site stuff at Timken, but then developed the whole clinic there at APD and opened it up to other employers. So they specifically have a protocol of working with employers. 
and they are the one place in the Upper Valley area that's gone into that specialty. And it's, they've been doing it now for, I think, close to 15 years. I think Dr. Collins, I don't know which one, I think he's, we talked about, we met him, he showed us around, it was a wonderful service. Um, both of them were nice, but this one was just, um, I just thought it was a very nice service. You know, as looking at this also as an employee, if I had to go there and, you know, had an issue, <coughs> I felt very comfortable with the doctors that I would be referred to and the fact that I can most likely go then go to a, carry on that basically through the same system, carry on through essentially the, almost the same provider. So I was fairly, I felt fairly comfortable with that. Are you comfortable going to doctors? Well, I mean, this cold's been going on and on and on. And so, I interestingly enough, I, I actually, the, the, the girl, that, the nurse that showed us around is actually from Heartland. And I was impressed to the point where I'm going to ask her for a family practitioner. Oh, so you don't have one. <laughs> since, I, since I've been, at, okay. in, in order to see my doctor, I got to go back up to St. J. Uh, so I, I need to see? detach myself. After two years, I yes. need one down here. Well, so the third paragraph on the second page, <coughs> it says that you should have a doctor. <laughs> so I have been suffering through NyQuil and okay. various other gizmos. Yeah, because you don't sound better than a I, week you know, ago. I feel, I'm feeling better now. Really? You know, it's just this. Is it like? Is it getting close to 7:30? No. Yeah. My medicine runs out. I need to renew at 7:30. <laughs> well, so I'm, okay. at, I'm I'm at the end of the the, the clock here. So I'm, well, I'm, I'm winding down. I'm glad this process has brought you to this recognition <sighs> that I'm better than I was the last week. At this Dave, time. you went to the Windsor County Mentor something about the celebration of the luncheon there. Yes, luncheon. Um, are, is this the program that works within the school systems? It is. Uh, they have expanded into the school systems, correct? Okay. And they now do like an in, in, in school service um, where, you know, they have mentors that will meet with students for, you know, an hour a week or, right. or two hours a week or something like that. Right. And when I last kind of paid attention to this, they were thinking of including part one. Have, have they done so? They have, yes. Great. Great. The only thing I was going to suggest, I think APD probably is the best choice. The only good thing about their choice, I would think, would be the hours. Which, so they have the weekends and late at, in the evenings. So you go from up to eight at night. You're right. And now so. day, I think, closes at four thirty. So uh, that is till eight. Clear choice, and oh. they're open on Saturday and Sunday too. And clear choice, you can walk in and house pick day if you call first. So there is. So could you offer two? Those could people choose or no? It has to be one designated. Um, I think it works best if you designate one. So there was that, actually we had that conversation at the Chinese food restaurant <laughs> next door with the VLCT folks about the two and um, they pointed out that uh, Clear Choice is open longer and you don't need to call for it. Yeah. Huh. yeah, because the plowing happens on weekends and at night. But if it's an emergency, you don't go there anyways. Well, I know, but you could also go after work, too. Because if you go to APP, APD, you got to make an appointment. So, I don't know. Just all I, had. Over. I think we felt as though, at the end of the day, from an overall perspective, the, the, the number of things they have intertwined at Alice Peck Day that are literally almost like two doors down, um, outweighed the hours. I think we felt as though um, you can, if you needed to go after hours, you simply, simply go to Alice Peck Day Emergency Room. And then again, it kind of, the communication makes its way and, and any follow-up would be at the <coughs> during normal working hours at the <coughs> 
Don't make them talk. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, <God>. that. <laughs> you know, I sit in my office all day long. I'm nice and quiet. Nothing. Mm -hmm. and I'm coughing. Coughing up a storm. But anyway. Not so much. Well, I mean, that, that is uh, specified on this page. Uh, the hours of operation, then it says if other treatment, the you know, hospital emergency room is the fallback. Isn't it uh, Mount Scott and Dallas Beck Day both in the same system with Dartmouth? With Dartmouth. In other words, yes or no? They're both in the same system. What I was getting at is if we used Mount Scott in the emergency room, would they be able to pass the information on to the um, to the Alaspect Day? On, on the same record system that yeah. in May just went to the record system via Mario Tonica and Hitchcock has. Mount Scott isn't on that. They're still they were every single hospital. Had a different electronic medical record system, and Hitchcock is now trying to get them all to be part yeah. of theirs, and so they're working it through like one hospital a year. Mm -hmm. It's an ambitious project. It's an it's it's a nightmare in my mind. Oh, I can't think of all the data conversion that has to go yeah. on. Okay, I guess we're done. Unless <coughs> somebody sent something else. Where are we meeting tomorrow night? I, is it, is it, do you go in to if you're facing Mike's at the left driveway? No, I didn't think so. Yeah. I think there's another driveway. There are two driveways. Either or. Doesn't matter. So you can go up. Turn, look around. We're all done. So you can go as you look at.